Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Kane, and I am the Friends of American Arts at Yale Curator of American Decorative Arts here at the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, I have, we're here today uh, to talk about three Newport high chests of drawers that are in the Leslie P. and George H. Hume American Furniture Study Center here at Yale. I've been studying Rhode Island furniture for the last 20 years, um, really quite intensively. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts and observations with you. With me today is Gary R. Sullivan, who is uh, an American art dealer specializing in American furniture and uh, early American clocks. Gary is also a scholar he has contributed to uh, the publication Harbor and Home, which uh, examined the furniture of Southeastern Massachusetts. He's also co-authored uh, a volume on the American musical clock and was a contributor to our publication on Rhode Island furniture uh, that was published in 2016. So Gary, I'm really pleased that you're uh, with me today to talk about these uh, three Newport pieces. Thank you. It's great to be here. So the, the art gallery has had a furniture study since uh, 1959. It was originally located in downtown New Haven in the basement of an industrial building. And uh, we were thrilled when we had the opportunity to create a new furniture study out here at uh, Yale's West Campus. Um, the furniture study here is larger. It's about 18,000 square feet. It has a lower double height level and a mezzanine. It houses about 1,300 objects ranging from furniture to uh, clocks and turned wooden objects. It also houses the Israel Sack Archive, uh, a great resource for studying American furniture. Now I'd like uh, to head down one of the aisles here in the furniture study where the high chests are located. There we go. Um, so it's uh, the way the furniture study is arranged is really by form and within the forms, uh, the objects are arranged chronologically. So here we're at the beginning of the high chest aisle with the various earliest high chests in the collection. And if we walk down this aisle, what we're trying to do for you today is simulate what a visit to the furniture study would be, which we unfortunately can't do right now because of the pandemic. But let's walk down this aisle. And here we are in front of the three high chests that Gary and I will be talking about. Uh, and that's my colleague, John Stewart Gordon, who's the Benjamin Atmore Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts, standing in front of the three pieces. And John is about six feet tall. And so as you can see, even though these objects are up on, uh, elevated on platforms, uh, they are really quite imposing pieces of furniture. And before we launch into our close look at these three objects, I'd just like to mention a few housekeeping tasks. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please submit your questions through using that device. Uh, John will be monitoring the questions. And at the end of the, when Gary and I have finished our conversation, uh, John will pose any um, questions that you've raised during the program uh, to us. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is everyone's Zoom screens are uh, configured somewhat differently. Uh, if our images, that is my image and Gary's image, are too large, um, if you hover over the vertical line that's between the uh, two panels of images, um, there will be um, a uh, 
button that will appear that will allow you to move to the right and make our images smaller and thereby make the objects bigger. So here's a frontal view of uh, these high chests. Um, and I just want to uh, say a few words about the form. Um, these, these high chests were, uh, are essentially made in two parts. There's an upper case, which has uh, rather large wide drawers, and that sits on a lower case that has uh, a configuration of smaller drawers. And this form um, was uh, typically used in a bedchamber, uh, probably largely to um, store clothing. Uh, it was often made en suite with a dressing table. And the probability is that most of these high chests were actually made for women. Uh, and they were oftentimes bought um, for those women by their parents on the occasion of a woman's marriage. And, um, and so that's an important aspect of how they fit in uh, culturally. I also want to say a word about Newport as a furniture making center. In uh, 18th century American furniture, I think um, Newport is often highly regarded as one of the most uh, important furniture making centers. And I hope by the end of this conversation today, you grasp uh, some sense of why that is. So here is a map of Narragansett Bay uh, from the mid eight or late 18th century. Uh, Providence is up here at the top of the bay. Towards the bottom of the bay, there's this very large island. This is the island, uh, Quidnick Island, uh, otherwise um, known as Rhode Island. So in the colonial period, this uh, colony was called Rhode Island and Providence Plantation. So everything that surrounded uh, Rhode Island was Providence Plantations. And Newport is right down near the southern tip of uh, Quidnick Island. As you perhaps can see, it's a very deep harbor and it has immediate access to the Atlantic Ocean. And here's Newport, that harbor in about 1740 from this overmantle uh, painting. Uh, what we see is this uh, little building here is the colony house, uh, newly constructed at that point. And in front of the colony house, as the century went on, a very big wharf, long wharf, would be developed to facilitate shipping. And um, an important figure had come to Newport just a few years before this painting was made, and that was John Bannister. And he initiated uh, transatlantic trade, um, which was a quite a lucrative trade. And so uh, from that point on, Newport really boomed as a mercantile center. And uh, with that trade, there were fortunes made. Uh, so the people who would have purchased uh, objects like the high chest we're looking at were either merchants, mariners, distillers who distilled uh, uh, molasses into rum, and uh, so there was a large um, well-to-do market for furniture in Newport. But perhaps more importantly, uh, and I'm uh, drawing your attention to the left of this image, this little spit of land with all the little buildings, this is Easton's Point. And this is where there was a very big concentration of joiners or what we might call today cabinet makers, the tan squares are joiner shops. So within this 12 block area, um, there were many uh, furniture makers working and the three high chests that were all made in about 1760 or thereabouts could well have all originated from this very small uh, concentration of uh, uh, tradesmen in this area. Um, and what they were doing in large part was making furniture to put on the ships to take part in that maritime trade. Um, and the furniture would be shipped south uh, to New York, to the southern plantations, 
uh, to the Caribbean and even to the north coast of South America. And uh, export of furniture was a very big part of the Newport economy. So let's come back to uh, the high chest to look at them overall one more time. Um, the, the, the Newport pieces have a, a number of sort of uh, um, individual um, features that allow one to identify uh, a piece as a Newport or Rhode Island object uh, quite quickly. And Gary, when we were first talking about this, you, you were just ticking off, as I recall, a number of these, these features. So um, what tells you immediately that these pieces probably originated in Rhode Island? Well, the, the things that I would notice uh, very quickly that point to Rhode Island uh, or, or even Newport in some instances, uh, the first thing would be the apron, what's going on in the apron or the skirt, as you might call it. Um, B and C have these carved um, shells in the, uh, in the center, and the form of those shells uh, really indicates a, a Rhode Island origin. And in the, in the case of, uh, of A, uh, the apron has this uh, deep cutout in the center, uh, you know, going up to the, to the finial, and the specific shape of, of that apron and, and the others um, really speaks to Rhode Island. You sometimes find a similar apron in Connecticut, but uh, in, in this case, it's, it's Rhode Island. Additionally, um, what's going on in the pediments uh, is, a, uh, is an indica indicator of a Rhode Island origin. For example, the, uh, the raised panels in the, in the tympanum, each one of these have, uh, have raised panels that conform to the, to the shape of the, uh, of the uh, pediment. And that says Rhode Island. Uh, they may have done it other places, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's going to be a, a Rhode Island uh, high chest. Also, the, the shape of the uh, openings, the uh, oculi, if you will. Um, whoop, Oops, sorry. I'm forward one slide. Um, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, the, the circular shape of those uh, cutout openings, and we'll we'll see it in the in the close-up slides. But uh, those are a couple of the things that uh, that that speak to Rhode Island, and also the ball and claw feet, the the shape of the of the feet and the ankles. And again, we'll look at those uh, in in more detail. So, in a way, um, uh, these makers are all working uh, within a community. Uh, and they develop this regional style. So they all share uh, certain uh, similarities of overall configuration. Um, but as you'll see, they interpret um, a particular um, features and uh, exterior features and construction features um, differently. And um, so let's progress and take a look. We're going to do this comparative looking working down from the top of the high chest to the bottom. And here we have uh, close-ups of those, um, those pediments. And um, as I have compared these, I'm really struck by the fact that on A and uh, C, the shape of this cornice molding um, is, uh, has a great deal of height and lift um, more so than the cornice molding on B. In fact, uh, the overall height of, of the, uh, the, the pediments on A and C uh, are just a, a lot um, taller. Mm -hmm. And they, Gary, um, what else do you notice about how these are um, similar, but um, the similarities I think are apparent, but how are they different? Um, well, they're they're different in that the uh, that A is uh, uh, is an open pediment, and so when you look through those circular openings, you're looking at the backboard of the uh, of the uh, of the the piece, and uh, it's open up above, whereas B and C are closed. There's a there's a board uh, right behind the the front pediment that closes it off. 
uh, and it creates a, a totally different look. But um, the most obvious difference to me is that B has a very low pediment. It's not nearly as attractive. It's not as grand as, as the other two. And those two uh, raised panels are much shorter. So they're, they're less effective. And these differences are very subtle, but uh, they make a difference in the overall look. Uh, the other thing that I notice on C is that that molding that you're pointing to right now follows around the oculi where most of the time it just goes along the bottom edge of the S-curved uh, cove molding. It just follows along there and then ends where as on, on C, it, uh, it goes around the circle and it's very subtle, but it's a wonderful detail and just gives it a, a much better look. And now let's take a closer look at these finials. Um, they're uh, all um, significantly different. I should say that of these three high chests, A is probably the earliest of the three. And uh, I think it's finial um, also reflects that. We believe that the finials on A and B are original to these pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and the finial on A is a very big urn that seems to have uh, fluting or gudruning going over its top, and then it has this egg-shaped uh, tip above. The, um, uh, the one in the center is a very unusual shape. Uh, it's a small urn, but then it has this, um, this banding of uh, arcade, and then the tip of the finial is this very elongated acorn. Um, it's quite a distinctive finial. Now the finial on uh, C is your more classic Newport finial, slightly, certainly later than A. Um, and it is this fluted uh, cupcake-like form with a flame above. And Gary brought with him today um, uh, an example of a Newport finial that shows how those, how those elements uh, go together. So here's, a, here's an example of a, a fin finial that's similar to, uh, to, to C. And this, this flame would be very difficult to carve with this in the way. It would get in the way of the carver's chisel, uh, as, uh, as would um, this would be difficult to carve because this part is in the way. But what they did in Newport was they developed a system that made it much easier to carve, and they made them in three pieces. So now um, the ball is not in the way. You can easily carve that. The base is not in the way, and you can you can carve this. Um, very simple, but uh, but brilliant. Uh, and very often on these finials, they're not carved all the way around. There's a section in the back that you can't see, and so why bother to uh, to carve it? Uh, and as far as uh, finial A, um, that's an earlier style that uh, uh, it, it is often larger. Than, uh, than the other finials that were used in Newport. And there are some related examples on um, early cl Newport clocks made by James Wadey and William Claggett that date to the uh, 1750s. So that's, a, that's a, uh, kind of a rare early finial. So now let's uh, take a look at these um, skirts. Um, because uh, I think a lot of the success of these objects really um, kind of begins uh, here. Um, I want you to notice how um, uh, on A and on C, there's sort of a lot more lift to the skirt than there is on uh, B. And uh, it has to do with these, uh, the classic Newport shape are these opposed C scrolls that make up, and each of this has it, this uh, outline of the skirt. But if you look, for instance, at B, um, this maker has left a lot more material uh, to the side of the C, and it just does not come up as high. There's more material above that curve than there is, let's say, on C. There's very little material here and less material here. And so this skirt has this real arc and spring to it, which um, as does A, which I think um, uh, I find um, 
uh, visually um, more successful. Would you agree, Gary? Very subtle, but but uh, a, a tremendous difference in the way your your eye reads the aesthetic of the of the piece. And uh, when you're when you don't have two side by side or three side by side to compare, sometimes you can't really put your finger on why you're looking at one and you say, "Wow, this is spectacular! This is great!" It's because all those elements come together and they and they work just a little bit better than they do on other examples. And as Gary said earlier, uh, these carved shells are really uh, the hallmark of Rhode Island uh, furniture. And uh, the high chest B and C each has um, uh, a carved shell at the center of its skirt. Um, and for me, um, the way the, the center of the, by center, I mean this lower element on each, um, the way on C, that element is integrated into the uh, rest of the carving, um, makes uh, the shell on C seem much more fluid and uh, voluptuous and alive. Um, is that the way you react to these shells, Gary? No comparison. There's, there's no comparison. C is, is so much uh, more well executed. Um, it has more lobes, which is uh, which is more successful. And uh, uh, if you look at the carved element in the in the center, it almost looks like a fleur de lis. And follow it straight up. Um, it terminates at the uh, top center with a point, um, as opposed to the other one, which has an even number of lobes. And so it terminates at the top in a in a hollow. And, and uh, the one on the right, C, is just so much more uh, effective. And the way the, the, the lobes terminate uh, at, the, at the outer edges, right at the base of the apron, is so much more successful in C than it is in, in B. So no comparison. Now let's take a look at um, these cabriole legs that the, the support on the case. Um, as I said earlier, A is probably the earliest of these high chests, and it and C have what we call knee carving, carving that drapes over the knee. Um, on A, I think it's really much more sort of embryonic, if you will, than C. Uh, the carving on C is the sort of full-blown uh, late colonial um, type carving that uh, you will find on the legs of Newport uh, case pieces. Um, uh, on A, it's almost, it reminds me of cut card work on silver. It just kind of lays on the surface. It isn't really integrated into the rest of the leg. Um, B uh, has no carving at all in that area. Uh, the carving, of course, would have added to the cost. It was extra steps, extra things you had to do. Um, and um, as I look at these three legs, um, C seems, the knees of C, C of, a, of B, excuse me, seem to be a little chunkier, a little more stolid, if you will. Um, although the whole leg has a certain kind of vigor and robustness that I do associate with Rhode Island uh, furniture. Is there anything you'd like to add a, to those comments, Gary, about these legs? You, if, you, uh, if you were just looking at small areas of, of, of the piece and including uh, some parts of the legs, you could look through a very small opening and say that is Newport or that's Rhode Island. And you can do that with these feet, uh, B, and C, B and C being the more classic uh, uh, ball and claw feet with the undercut talons, so-called undercut talons, where they uh, actually carved an opening behind the, uh, the talon, which is extraordinary. Uh, and A has a very nice uh, Rhode Island foot as well with these uh, pronounced uh, uh, knuckles, but uh, B and C are the, are the ones that you really um, recognize as, as being uh, Newport. And uh, uh, Pat, do you want to talk about uh, the discovery that, that you made on C? Um, oops, sorry, folks. Um, yes, actually, I did not make this discovery. Uh, Eric Groning of Sotheby's made this discovery. 
uh, he came to see this high chest many years ago and uh, told us there was actually an opening above the ball um, on our high chest, which we hadn't um, seen because it was all clogged with, um, you know, the accumulation of years of dust and dirt. And so um, some of these Newport claw and ball feet will actually have not only the open talons, but also uh, a cut through at the top of the ball, which is, um, you know, quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and I would add that A is, is atypical in that it has this webbing, this kind of um, webbing between the talons, if you will, whereas most of the Newport claw and ball feet uh, do not have that webbing um, mm -hmm. at all. On, uh, on C, they uh, they made an, the carver made an effort to raise the, uh, the 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 claw the talon up off the ball and kind of separate it and you know this is really extraordinary and and uh, uh, you don't typically find it elsewhere usually the the claw is basically sitting on the ball closer to A but in these um, he really undercut it uh, tremendously and on these these great uh, Newport feet, uh, you see the tendons coming up the, the ankle, as you can really see right there on, on, on C, and it's just a, uh, it's a uniquely Newport uh, look that just, it's extraordinary. So this is a, a three-quarter view of uh, C, and uh, we wanted to show this to you because these uh, case sides of uh, Newport pieces, uh, what you're looking at is uh, a large expanse of, of wood. Uh, if this was a high chest that had been made in Massachusetts or uh, Connecticut or elsewhere, there would be a line here, which would be the leg continuing up and being physically fastened to the skirt board and the side of the case. But in Rhode Island, uh, the legs are not uh, integrated into the into that structure through some fastening mechanism. They are simply glued in place. So this is the an interior view of that leg. And you see that the leg actually ends here. The cabriole leg is ended here. And what holds it into this case is glue blocks. There's one right here. And you see the shadow of another glue block that's fallen off. Uh, on the other side, and then a, there is a glue block above that. So it's uh, a form of construction that is uh, tied to Rhode Island um, and is quite different from the way uh, makers and other colonies um, approached uh, this, this construction. And I know, Gary, you have some theories about these, these legs. Well, I'm going to go with the old school theory that detachable legs were, were made that way because it made the piece easier to ship. Um, the, uh, the, the legs just slide out. Uh, and every once in a while, you find one where they've never been glued in. They just uh, slid into, uh, into place. So my, my theory is that they, that they were shipped with the legs off and then um, glued into place when they arrived. And I, and I think you have a different theory about that, but. <laughs> well, uh, my sense is that uh, the way um, William and Mary high chests were made, um, um, they, uh, the legs were turned, of course, but they were separate from the case and the case sides and the front and the back were dovetailed together. And so the Rhode Island makers are continuing that older tradition. And I think there's a real streak of conservatism that operates um, in Rhode Island uh, cabinet making. Mm -hmm. I, and I think it's it's interesting to note that on these Rhode Island pieces, the case, the lower case sides and the backboards of the lower case are dovetailed together. So if you're looking at the at the back of it, you see a long line of, of dovetails where you wouldn't see that on uh, pieces made elsewhere. So now let's continue our exploration of the interior. Um, here are the uh, largest, deepest drawers of the, um, um, the widest and deepest drawers of these three pieces. Uh, it shows us something about um, Rhode Island um, drawer construction. Uh, the 
uh, lines that you see at the bottom of these drawers, uh, this line is actually the uh, edge of the drawer bottom coming through under the side and fitting into uh, rabbits in this lower uh, dovetail uh, pin. And then a little, uh, another strip of wood is added to that as the running mechanism. And um, again, in the early 18th century, for instance, in Boston, this is the way on William and Mary high chest, the drawers tend to be constructed. And um, in most places by the mid 18th century, cabinet makers have moved to um, having the drawer bottoms fit into grooves in the side. But the Rhode Islanders, um, not everyone, but by and large, uh, continue this older construction method. What we also are looking at here are the kinds of secondary woods that Rhode Island makers, by secondary I mean the woods that are kind of hidden from view. Um, the drawer that is B has this sort of striated quality to the drawer side and that's uh, because that maker has chosen chestnut for his drawer sides. Uh, A and C have um, much smoother wood uh, another of the favorite woods of Rhode Island cabinet makers, A, is actually yellow poplar or tulip poplar, uh, widely used as a secondary wood in Rhode Island. And on C, uh, th that drawer side, when this piece first came into the furniture study, we identified its secondary wood on the sides as being yellow poplar. But um, when we had the wood analyzed, it turned out to be um, cottonwood, which uh, a lot of Rhode Island makers actually use cottonwood. And I just want to take a moment to look at the dovetails. Here on the early one, we have three dovetails that fasten the side to the front. On the middle one, we have five pins here. And on C, we've got seven. And um, I'd just like to make the point that cutting each of those pins uh, takes time, and time is money. And um, so the maker of C uh, really took, um, was willing to invest additional time in uh, the making of this piece. I'm not sure it made it uh, any more functional, um, but um, it demonstrates a great deal of care. Anything you wanna add about the dovetails, Gary? <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I don't. I don't think that C is any stronger uh, than than A necessarily. Uh, it's just a, a great attention to uh, to detail. And one of the things that you find over and over again on Newport furniture are beautifully rendered dovetails that are just very tight and clean, and often they're very small, uh, as as with C. So um, it was just a, a high level of craftsmanship. Uh, I'm showing this slide again because the next feature we're going to discuss are these little um, these elements between the uh, small uh, drawers at the bottom of the case. Uh, so I just wanted you to understand what we're looking at in these next slides. So these are the vertical styles that um, separate the drawers um, and um, each of these makers, I hope you can see, has chosen a very different way to uh, construct those. On A, he, here's the style, and this maker uh, brings it all the way down to the very edge of the skirt, and he uh, strengthens it by these two glue blocks on either side, which he's then shaved away so you wouldn't see them from the exterior. On B, the maker just uses a single piece of wood he doesn't bring it all the way down to the tip of the uh, skirt. He uh, simply nails it in place, no glue blocks. And on C, the vertical style here, the divider between the drawers, actually is resting on the um, bottom of the drawer opening and uh, originally had a block. All we are seeing now is the shadow of where the block was. So this maker uh, uses um, one block and he goes nowhere near the skirt of the thing. So it's just more evidence of how we're seeing three different shop traditions and three different ways of solving the same uh, problem. Mm -hmm. Now the backs of these objects are not 
uh, significantly different. Each of the backboards, each back is made up of three horizontal boards, pretty big boards that are simply nailed to rabbits in the case sides. Um, and that's a typical way um, many places uh, constructed uh, case backs in that way. What is slightly different is the way the pediments are, um, are backs work. Uh, here we have these, you know, big sort of bell-shaped domed um, pediment backboards. Um, but the one in the center, and this probably is very hard for people to see on these small images, there are uh, tiny little uh, rectangular elements here. And those are the tips of transverse uh, battens that run and support those uh, bonnet boards. And um, there are a number of related examples by this maker, and they all have this particular and peculiar feature. Um, and it's one of the ways I've been able to bring together a group of these objects and relate them to this high chest at Yale. And this is another one of those features that if you if you looked just at that view of the of the back of the upper section, you would say Rhode Island because it's it's closed in at the top where in most other places there's a sort of a square cutout in the in the center where you can see right through from the from the front to the back, but they they closed them entirely in, in Rhode Island. And so here we're looking at the bottom on uh, the backboards of the bottom cases. And you see that A and C have these serpentine lines, these cutouts and these uh, arcing or raised uh, voided shapes in, uh, on their backboards. Whereas on uh, B, the backboard um, is just uh, straight across, no extra um, um, shaping of the lower edge. So you might say, so why, nobody ever sees the surface, it's up against a wall. Why go to the trouble of um, shaping uh, the bottom edge of those um, backboards? But as you may recall, um, when we looked at the front of the lower cases, A and C had a much higher sort of arc to the skirt. Um, and so uh, what we feel the maker here is, is the makers of A and C are doing, are making sure that when you look at the front of the high chest, you're not looking through those um, high arcs to uh, the backboard. And so they've taken this extra step of, um, of, uh, of shaping that um, so that it doesn't show from the front side. Just more pride in craftsmanship. They could have just Packed that out, and uh, uh, they they made it, you know, finely finished, which wasn't necessary, but uh, just one of those extra features you find in Newport furniture. So uh, let's just take a a, a look at uh, at these three objects um, overall again. Um, a, as I said, is probably the earliest of them. Uh, for one thing, its brasses are uh, smaller. They don't have the frilly, fussy outlines of B and C. Um, and it has what we've noted as the earlier finial. It also has the uh, center arc of the skirt, which is an earlier feature. Unfortunately, we do not know who made this high chest. Um, it's um, so far, we haven't been able to um, decipher uh, or associate it with any particular maker. Uh, B is, um, I've been uh, working on uh, B and it's uh, quite a few related pieces. Um, and I think I know who made this group of high chests and other case pieces. Um, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic uh, has interrupted my research. I need to make another research trip and um, that's been suspended. So I haven't been able to finish up um, the article and, um, and publish uh, those findings. Uh, but C, we actually is actually a signed piece of furniture. And I'm going to show you here the signature uh, in uh, one of the long drawers on the interior. It says, made by John Townsend Newport, 1759. And signed pieces of American furniture are really, really rare. Um, and 
Um, so when this uh, signature was discovered in the furniture study, we were really overjoyed. Um, John Townsend is, um, uh, I mean, he's a renowned cabinet maker um, in the panoply of, of uh, American furniture makers. There was a monographic exhibition of him uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, organized by Morrison Heckscher in uh, 2005. Um, and uh, so um, it's, it's wonderful to have um, um, a signed piece by John Townsend in our collection. And so, uh, Gary, um, you know, there's a famous grading system uh, introduced by the furniture um, um, dealer and scholar Albert Sack uh, in his Fine Points book published in 1950, where he, he graded pieces as good, better, and best. Um, so if you were going to grade these Yale high chests according to Albert's um, uh, grading system, how would you come out with them? Well, using his grading system, I would rate them all best. Uh, but um, if, if you asked me to rate these three uh, against one another, um, it's, a, it's a pretty easy uh, choice. Uh, my, uh, my vote would be C is, uh, is hands down the, the finest of the, uh, of the three. And there's a reason that John Townsend is so revered as a, as a cabinet maker. Um, his attention to detail was, was amazing. So um, if, if, if I were to compare B and C, which are the most similar because they have the, the, um, uh, they both have the carved shell, um, just sort of going from top to bottom, um, I can point out the, the features that I think make C uh, more special. So we, we already talked about the, uh, how high the, the, uh, the bonnet is on C as opposed to B. That's a big difference. Um, the, uh, the size and shape of those, those panels, just compare the, uh, compare the two of them between B and C. There's no comparison. That little molding that runs around the oculus. Um, the fact that C has three finials rather than, than one, um, I just think that, uh, that three is a more appealing uh, look, even though some of them only had a single finial in the, in the center. Um, I like that there's a, uh, that there's a, a fluted uh, plinth below the central uh, finial um, rather than uh, a plain one like, uh, like on B, and the finial is, is raised up higher. Uh, I also like that the background in the uh, in the the uh, cutouts there. Pat, maybe you could use your pointer as um, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so on. that th that surface is actually uh, intentionally darkened. It's it's painted or stained black, which uh, which makes that negative space really uh, stand out, and it gives you the uh, shows you the shape of the of the oculi, if if you will. Uh, and moving down the uh, the case, uh, actually, if you if you just sort of compare the two, the, the shape of them and the proportion, just sort of stand back and let your eye go from one to the other. C is so much more pleasing. It's got more lift. It's narrower. Everything about it is uh, is more appealing. And these differences are so subtle. But when you have an opportunity to compare two pieces that are as close as these, you really see the difference. Um, Moving down the case, uh, the graduation is better. The graduation of the drawers is better in C. So uh, the difference between the height of the lower drawer in the upper case and the upper drawer in the upper case is more dramatic in C, which is more pleasing to the eye. So look at the, look, compare the height of that top. Uh, it's, a, it's a split top drawer. So those are actually two small drawers. So compare the height of, of those drawers in C uh, to be a uh, tremendous difference. Um, the uh, C has quarter columns in the, in the upper case, in the, the, whoop, in, the uh, in the front corners. It's a little difficult to see, but uh, that's, a, that's an added feature right there. There are quarter columns in the, in the case. Uh, moving down to the, to the base, we already talked about the difference in the, in the shells. Uh, C has more lobes, it's better executed. Um, the, the shape of the, of the apron is more pleasing. 
um, and then moving down the, the, the leg, C has wonderful carved uh, knees, uh, which which add a add a lot, and the and the way the feet and ankles are executed in C is uh, is extraordinary. So uh, so if those would seem to be the two logical uh, choices, um, I pick. Uh, I pick C, which is probably no surprise to uh, to, to Pat, but you, you might be surprised at my second choice, which you might think would be B because it's got the carved shell, but it's it's actually A. Um, I agree with that, Gary. I think A um, has has a lot going for it. Um, it, it does. And I, I would not argue with that at all. But you know, I think uh, there are a lot of questions out there, I'm told. So I think it's time... Um, to uh, John Gordon, as I said earlier, has been um, monitoring the questions. So um, John, um, since there are a lot of questions, can you um, pose some of those to us? Yeah, uh, let's start with a maybe a triple barreled question because it's a question we get a lot in the furniture study. It's one of my favorites. And Gary kind of hinted to it because in his, um, extolling number C, he mentioned height a lot. And uh, people are curious about why these things, why is a high chest high? Um, why not make shorter legs so you can actually get into those top drawers? And what would you have in those top drawers? I'm gonna let you answer that one, Pat. Well, I think um, the high chests are high because uh, they're not about function. They are about um, making a magnificent uh, presence in a room, uh, a presence that had uh, certainly architectural features um, that could even have echoed some of the uh, paneling of a room. And so uh, the goal here, I think, was to make uh, a magnificent object and not just a functional object. And I'm sure in those top drawers, you probably put things that you didn't need every day and in the drawers that were easily within that you could look into and know what was in there, um, that's where you put the things you used um, more frequently. And in fact, it's quite typical for those lower drawers to, to exhibit a lot more wear than the upper drawers, the very tip top drawers. And it's actually common for the top drawers to be locking um, so they put special things in there. So uh, A, you can see that the, uh, uh, the, the uh, pulls for the top drawers are actually escutcheon pulls. They've got the holes for the, uh, for the, uh, for the lock. Uh, and that's why they're placed up at the top of the, of the drawer because the lock dictated that that's where they needed to be. I actually had to take a part B yesterday um, to have this photograph taken. And um, I was surprised, I had forgotten that those top drawers also lock, but you cannot see a lock from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so would you, either of you uh, who know what I'm talking about want to share this little very cool design detail with the group? Go ahead, Pat. Yes, actually, B and C both have what are called Quaker locks on those uh, two small drawers at the top of the case. And so the... Uh, the upper of the wide drawers uh, does have an escutcheon. You could lock that with a key. And then if you open that drawer and you reach in, you're able to um, push up this little latch. Usually they're um, sort of strips of hickory or wood that has a lot of spring to it and release that. And then you can open uh, the drawer. And what it allows those two pieces to do, which is not true of A, uh, it allows the, the rhythm of the, um, the brasses going up the case to always be at the center of the drawers. Whereas on A, because these have to lock and reach the, uh, the uh, divider above the drawer, the maker has had to elevate that last, the top brasses there, which kind of breaks up the sort of, sorry about that, breaks up the nice um, um, progression of the, of the brasses. And th they saved money by using those Quaker locks because the hardware was very expensive. So to, to use uh, two fewer locks uh, saved some money. 
So you mentioned that these were often associated with um, young women um, kind of entering into marriage. And do we know that, you know, did you just go to your local high chest shop and get your daughter a high chest or how did the process of commissioning these happen? Well, uh, um, we do have um, documentation um, for a young woman, um, Eunice Rhodes from um, Providence, uh, going with another woman from Providence. They uh, came down to Newport and they go shopping for furniture and they actually go to see Mr. Goddard, John Goddard. And um, they tell him uh, what they're interested in. And he tells them uh, what he can make the pieces for. She was looking at that point for a uh, desk and bookcase. And she says, oh, that's a very dear price you're quoting me. I think I'll go and see what others can do. And she does that. And she says, you know, but if I, um, you know, I may come back. And indeed she comes back. So um, there's an instance of, um, you know, a young woman uh, on the verge of marriage, actually, and her new husband is actually the one who's paying for this furniture. Um, and so um, she goes shopping herself. Um, I have another uh, documented case of a high chest owned by a woman. Um, and um, I believe her parents, um, they do not live in Rhode Island. They live out of state. And through a family connection, I believe they go to a family member to uh, order her high chest and a dressing table. And so I'm sure it worked in different ways. And I don't want to say that every single high chest was um, made for um, a woman um, on the verge of marriage. But I, I do think it is the, the a very important strain in how these objects uh, came into being. There's a lot of interest in um, the secondary wood and people are um, curious how, how the various woods get chosen. Um, is there consideration, is it the cost? Is it the density? Is it the availability? Uh, when a cabinet maker grabs that piece of wood, what are they thinking? Well, I, I, I think the, uh, the availability is, is important and, and cost plays into that. If it's plentiful uh, in your region, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be more affordable. But uh, they also chose woods uh, according to how they could work them. Some woods were easier to work, work than others. So you may want to expand on that, Pat. Um, since I've never worked wood, I, I don't know that I can expand on that. But uh, the other wood I didn't mention that we find a great deal in, in Rhode Island furniture is pine. Uh, you find that throughout the colonies as a secondary wood. Um, but for instance, in Massachusetts, uh, uh, a yellow poplar really doesn't grow much further north than, than Rhode Island and Connecticut. So you don't find it because it isn't uh, a local wood in Massachusetts. Um, and I think chestnut and cottonwood must have been very plentiful in uh, Rhode Island, certainly also in uh, Chestnut in Connecticut. You find it a lot in Connecticut furniture and in Southeast uh, Massachusetts furniture. So I think uh, for the secondary woods, they're really uh, drawing on uh, the local uh, economy and, and what um, people harvesting wood are making available. One person asked a really interesting question, at least to me, um, about chestnut, because there is a visual similarity between chestnut and oak, and oak is more often found as a secondary wood in English furniture. So um, he's wondering, is there a relationship between, um, could you, is there a relationship between you know, the English use of oak and the Rhode Island use of chestnut? Is it an English tradition that gets transplanted? Is it English heritage of the cabinet maker? I wouldn't. That's a very think. interesting question. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I sort of doubt it because um, uh, to my knowledge, none of the makers in Rhode Island um, uh, were newly uh, immigrated from England. Um, most of them uh, come from families that had settled um, uh, some time ago or 
uh, either in Rhode Island, and there was a lot of migration out of Massachusetts into Rhode Island. Um, but I don't have any documentary evidence for a maker coming from England um, uh, into, I mean, in the 18th century. Uh, right. At the beginning, they were all coming from England. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. the, the later makers, um, I don't find an uh, immigration pattern there. I think it's just that the woods are visually similar. Chestnut, oak, and, and ash look very similar um, outwardly. But it just, they used what was available locally, and it just happened to be chestnut. So, Gary, we've talked a lot about, or we, you have talked a lot about the kind of the maker. Could you just elaborate a little bit on how the kind of the shop was constructed? Is it just one person working alone, or is it the phrase we love at Yale, the work of many hands? It, it, it was the work of many hands. There was the, the master who typically had uh, uh, apprentices, and, uh, and very often uh, they had journeymen who, who had sort of graduated from the, the apprentice uh, program and were uh, working for pay uh, in, the, in the shop. So it was a, uh, it was a, a team effort, and uh, Pat probably has more to say about that. Yeah, I mean, typically the biggest shops had uh, five benches, for instance. So, um, you, and there's lots of evidence of, of multi-generational uh, uh, workers within, within shops, definitely. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're cranking out furniture for export. I mean, these I don't think were cranked out for export, but um, desks and uh, small oval tables um, made in big numbers to be shipped. Um, just one final question. Um, you know, we're dealing with mahogany, which is definitely a, a, a offshoot of the slave trade. In those shops, do we know if there were enslaved workers working on these objects? I have not been able to find any documentary evidence of uh, enslaved workers in these shops. I'm sure it probably existed. Um, and someday we'll probably find some documentation. But I have been through a lot of paper in Rhode Island, court records, uh, anything I could lay my hands on, and I haven't turned it up yet. So there's still work to be done, which is exciting. Um, so I want to thank everybody for spending your um, your Friday midday with us in our virtual furniture study tour. I want to thank Pat Kane and Gary Sullivan for sharing your thoughts. Um, if we have whetted your curiosity about Rhode Island, we will also give you options to sate it. Um, if you do not own a copy of Art and Industry in Early America, the um, catalog that Yale produced in 2016 with essays by Pat and Gary and others. Um, you should have it in your home library. I have it in mine. Um, it's available anywhere where books are sold. And you can, and if you don't want to do that, just stay on your computer and visit uh, the Rhode Island Furniture Archive. Um, there are about 6,000 pieces of Rhode Island furniture included in the archive as well as the biographies of makers and owners. It's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. And um, until our next furniture study tour, we hope everyone stays safe, happy, and healthy. Thank you. Oh, and I also supposed to tell you, this is recorded <laughs> and um, if you want a, pre, a reprise next week on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, look, for, look for our furniture study tour of Rhode Island furniture. Thank you. <laughs>